questions. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Fabrizio, for inviting me here, and uh, welcome, everybody, to these lectures. So, <clears throat> do you hear me? No? <clears throat> okay. Maybe I can just move it here. Or otherwise you can use the big mic. Okay, maybe I use the big mic. That works. Okay, so do you hear me? Yeah, good. So, good morning, good, good afternoon. And um, <clears throat> this is the first of three lectures that I'm going to uh, present to you, and uh, during which I would like to discuss uh, some basic uh, introductory subject on the topic of um, what are the limits and the possibility offered by quantum mechanics in... Uh, okay, so... Why? In, uh, um, in the process of extracting information from a quantum system. <clears throat> so basically what I'm going to do is uh, um, uh, while entering this field, I will, I will present you something about quantum communication, and this is the topic of this uh, lecture that I'm going to give today. And then I will move uh, to presenting you some basic uh, result on quantum metrology. Okay, so I have three objects to deal with. I, I'm not sure I can do that. <laughs> the microphone, the, the, the laser and pointer, and the, and the computer. But anyway, so uh, let's discuss about quantum communication. So first of all, uh, it is important to notice that quantum communication is a theory of open quantum systems. So basically, more precisely, we deal with um, what happens when you try to send quantum signal through a communication channel that uh, we represent as uh, um, a medium which, uh, is, uh, uh, which is an external uh, environmental medium through which the, 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 the signal propagates. And basically in quantum communication you assume uh, an input-output formalism where basically you give uh, to one, uh, you have two parties, say Helis and Bob, the sender of the message and the receiver of the message. Uh, you give Helis the possibility of manipulating the, the quantum signal, the initial state of the quantum signal that you want to send through the communication line. And you give Bob the possibility of instead manipulating or operating on the, 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 the messages which have been transferred and transformed uh, by the action of the environmental noise that represent uh, the dynamics of the pulse that propagate through the uh, communication line. So this is the main, the, the typical setting that we are going to discuss. So the outlook of my presentation is basically the following. First of all, I would like to spend a few words in, by uh, introducing the basic uh, uh, properties of of quantum channels, so what, we, what, what these uh, objects are, how do we characterize them in quantum information. Then I will uh, briefly recall some basic idea of quantum communication, of classical communication theory, uh, which will provide us uh, the, the figure of merit that allows us to establish under which condition and what are the, 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 the possibility that uh, uh, we have when we want to transfer message through a communication line. And as I told you, first we will review this, uh, some basic notion uh, that have been developed in classical information theory. And then we will generalize these ideas into the context of quantum information and we will introduce the notion of quantum capacities of, of a quantum channel. And basically we will study uh, what is the efficiency uh, of uh, communication when you try to send classical message through a quantum channel or when you try to send quantum information through a quantum channel and so on and so forth. And uh, in the, at the end, if I do have time, I would like to give, to discuss a specific example of a quantum communication line which is given by the so-called bosonic Gaussian channels model. Okay, so 
Let's discuss about quantum channel. As I told you, a quantum channel in our representation just describes the evolution of a quantum system in the presence of an external environment. And these, basically, this object will allow us to represent the propagation of quantum message from the sender to the receiver. Now, in this representation, we assume a sort of discrete uh, discrete time evolution, meaning that there is not real time the, time, the the propagation time is fixed, and you only are interested in characterizing what happens uh, to some uh, to the input state that Alice is, uh, is preparing uh, during the, the transferring of the message for a fixed uh, temporal evolution, which basically is associated with the time it takes from, to the signal to go from Alice's lab to Bob's lab. Okay, so uh, as a matter of fact, there are several ways in which you can characterize these kind of mappings, and uh, there are at least three equivalent uh, way of introducing this object. There is a physical or a extrinsic uh, representation of the channel, there is an intrinsic representation, and finally there is an axiomatic representation of this object. Let's, let's start with the, the first one, the physical, representation. So the, in the physical representation of a quantum channel, basically you, you observe that the propagation of, uh, of your messages through the environment is basically due to the, the interaction of the message that you have selected, which have been prepared, say, in a quantum state row, uh, and, uh, and these, uh, these messages are interacting with an external environment, which is the Mm, the medium of, that represents the quantum channel itself, and therefore you treat the system, say the carrier, the information carrier and the environment as a, a, a joint system which you can assume to be isolated from the rest of the universe. According, these two objects will evolve through a unitary transformation, uh, through, uh, which, which depends upon the Hamiltonian that um, basically governs the interaction between the system and the environment. And um, there will be also some time associated with the propagation of the signal. The Hamiltonian plus the time gives you a complete definition of this unitary U that defines the evolution of system and environment. So in this representation, basically you associate, you introduce the input state of the environment at the, the initial, at the beginning of the communication uh, of the transmission, and this is the state zero which uh, I'm going to assume to be pure, and this is always possible because you can, even if the initial state of the environment was not pure at the beginning of the transmission, you can purify it by adding some extra degree of freedom that allows you to describe the initial density matrix of the environment as a pure state. So you start with a joint state, which is rho tensor, the state of the environment, then these two guys evolve through the unitary, unitary coupling. And at this point, because the environment is, do, uh, you don't have really access to the environment, but only on the uh, degree of freedom of the transmitted uh, uh, system, which is uh, represented by this guy here, you have to trace out the degree of freedom of E. And when you do that, you define the final mapping in this form. This is, uh, the extrinsic or Stein spring representation of your propagation. So you start from rho and you end up into a new state which is phi of rho, which is obtained through this transformation. Now, it turns out that this representation is, can be also in, uh, casted in a different form, which is called the intrinsic or Krauss representation of the, of the mapping. And uh, in this representation, the propagation of the signal can be fully described by introducing a collection of operators which only act on the Hilbert space of the, of the carriers. And these are the MK operator I'm, I'm writing here. And these operators are called the Krauss operator of, that represent the channel. And they have only a single prop, a, 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 they, have, they only uh, have uh, a single property, and the, and the property they have is that they fulfill this uh, normalization condition. That is, if you take the, the multiplication of mk with mk dagger, and then you sum with respect to the index k, uh, you must have the identity operator on the Hilbert space of the uh, input signal. 
So the, uh, it turns out that for uh, given a quantum channel, which is described in the Stein Springs form, you can also represent it into the Krauss representation, in Krauss form, and vice versa. So these two representations are kind of equivalent. You can move from one to the other in the, uh, as you like. So as I told you, there is also an axiomatic way of representing a quantum channel. And in this axiomatic way, you simply define the mapping phi, which represents the transformation of your input into the output, as a superoperator that is an operator that acts on the space of state, which in our case are described by density matrix. It's a superoperator which is linear in the space of uh, uh, linear operators of the system that is fulfilled this kind of property here. If you, if you apply the action of the map into a linear combination of operators on the input, then uh, the action of phi is just given by the action uh, can be obtained as the sum of uh, the action of phi on the individual component of the uh, sum you started with. So it's, linear, it's a linear operator. Also, has to be trace preserving, in meaning that if you compute the trace of a, a generic operator theta, which uh, uh, lives in the input Hilbert space of your system, and then you uh, compare the trace of this object with the trace of the transformed operator, these two guys has to be the same. Okay? And finally, uh, a quantum channel uh, fulfill a third hypothesis, a third property, let's say, uh, which is complete positivity. Okay, so what does it mean to be complete positive? Uh, first of all, let's discuss what it means to be positive. So uh, a superoperator uh, is said to be positive if uh, it sends positive operators into positive operators. So if you start with an operator rho, which is a positive semi-definite, so for instance, if it is a density matrix, then it's transformed version under the action of the, uh, of the map has to be also positive. And now it turns out that this property is, uh, is, uh, uh, is enough to guarantee that any input state of your initial Hilbert space is going to be transferred into a legitimate output state of the same system, which is a good thing. Yet, uh, positivity is not sufficient to characterize quantum channels. Indeed, what you need is complete positivity. And complete positivity basically is uh, basically the, similar, the same requirement that we have asked here, but applied not to phi, but to any extension of the channel phi into an extended Hilbert space that include the original degree of freedom plus extra degree of freedom. Why we do need that? And the reason we do need that is the following. So S, suppose that S is the state, uh, is the system that we use as a quantum carrier that we want to transfer. And suppose that this guy is interacting with your environment under the action of this channel phi. Well, now consider what happens if uh, your initial state, uh, your initial system S is not prepared in some isolated uh, state, but is uh, instead part of a density matrix rho S A, where A is an, is a, um, an ancillary system which has been initially entangled with the, the system S. Well, uh, even under this condition, because of the action of the, uh, of the environment that in this case still only interact with S but not with A, we do expect that after the interaction with the environment, this joint state is gonna be transformed into a state. And if we want to have this property, we have to ask complete positivity. So only if the channel phi is completely positive, it will map joint state of S with an ancillary into joint state of the two system. Okay, so, uh, and uh, this discussion about complete positivity is relevant because there are example, non-trivial example of positive operator which are not completely positive. And the point is that we only have to consider completely positive transformation if we want to describe the evolution under the action of an environment or um, 
because otherwise we don't have this property and the interpretation of quantum mechanics basically breaks down. Okay, that's enough. So this is the formal uh, representation of our quantum channel. They have this different way of being represented in terms of Steinspring or Krauss or axiomatic uh, representation. What, uh, now what I would like to discuss, what are the extra properties, what, what else we, can we say about quantum channels? So suppose we have one of these transformations which represent the evolution of the system under the interaction with an environment. Then uh, because of, these, of the properties of these maps, uh, it, it turns out that these transformations are non-expansive. So from uh, the complete positivity and trace preserving property of, uh, of the channels, it follows that these maps are contractive. What does it mean? It means that if you apply the same transformation to two different states of your initial state, say row one and row two, these are two density metrics of the information carrier that you want to send, uh, then after the interaction of the environment, these two, the transformed state, are going to be closer than the original one. And when I discuss about the, um, of course, in order to be precise in this representation, I need to introduce a matrix in, this, in the space of density matrix. And for instance, I'm referring here to the trace distance, trace distance into uh, um, the trace distance. Okay, so quantum channels are non-expansive uh, transformation in the space of density matrix. And this fact has two main consequences. The first consequence is that the complete, uh, the complete positive transformation, the quantum channel, are typically not physically invertible. What does it mean? Uh, this, it means that there exists no physical process that can reverse the action in general, of a quantum channel. Of course, they can be mathematically be, mathema um, invertible from the mathematical point of view, but the point is that there is no physical process that can implement the inverse, the inverse transformation that we are talking about, because the inverse transformation is going to be also contractive, so sh it cannot undo this kind of behavior. The second consequence uh, that follows from the fact that quantum channels are not expansive has to do with the fact that Every one or each one of these channels admit at least a fixed point. What is a fixed point? A fixed point is a state, a special state of your carrier that is left unchanged by the action of the quantum channel. Okay. So let's discuss. A, yep. Well, we will discuss this property in a moment. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, yeah? Yes, at least one, always. Sorry? Yes. Sure. Just take an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian and the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian will be left unchanged by the evolution, by, by the unitary uh, uh, evolution induced by your Hamiltonian. Yeah. No, it has. It always has. This is a generic property. Any completely positive trace preserving process must have at least a fixed point. And this is going to be a density matrix. We are, sorry, so maybe we sh I, I should have been a little bit more precise. When I discuss the evolution of open quantum system, I always refer to state as density matrix. Okay? Why time dependent? There is no time dependence here. As I told you, we fix the evolution time, okay? And we study for a given temporal evolution of the interaction, the mapping between the input and the output. Yeah. Okay. So, sorry, just a moment. Let me try to be a little bit more precise.
Sorry, I cannot hear you. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Uh, it's not easy to, 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 to describe. It. So it's not simple to, to find a, a direct, um, a, a, so there is not way, a, sim a simple way to connect the Krauss representation of the channel uh, with the fixed point of the channel itself. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not unique. You can have more than a, f a single fixed point. It depends on the channel. Let me just give you an example. Yeah? Okay, so a trivial example of a quantum channel is a unitary transformation. Uh, so this transformation here is simply what you have when you don't interact with an, with an environment. Okay? So your system will evolve through this kind of mapping where V is a unitary operator. This is just the evolution of an isolated system. Yeah? Now, if you have a mapping of this form, of course, the time has been fixed, okay? Clearly, you have infinitely many fixed points. So just take a generic eigenstate of V, and this guy is going to be a fixed point. Yeah? No, just a moment. So in that kind of example, just take Psi, which is an eigenvector of V, okay? Because this is, this is unitary, this guy is just a phase, because unitary operators have just, you know, eigenvalues of that form. Therefore, when you do apply the mapping to it, you get Psi, because the phase that you get here cancel out with the phase that you get here. That's kind of trivial, isn't it? Yeah. So any state of this form is going to be a fixed point, but not only those. You can just take convex combination of this object, and you still will have fixed points. Yeah? Yeah, for more general, there is a theorem that tells you that there exists at least always a fixed point. I'm not proving the theorem, but I'm telling you that there is a theorem that proves that for any CPT, there exists at least a fi one fixed point. That's a fact, okay? You may not believe in it, but it's a fact. Okay, <laughs> okay so now what happened? Jeez. Okay, so no, uh, yeah. if you try to, to solve that, uh, I will continue. Yeah. Okay, in the blackboard. So this is one example of, uh, of a quantum channel, but this is not, of course, just a trivial example. Other example of quantum channel, for instance, is given that by an object of that form. So you take rho and you map it into something like P of rho plus one minus P trace of rho tensor the identity divided by d. So this is uh, a CPT map uh, which, uh, with some probability p, doesn't change the initial state of your system. And with complementary probability 1 minus p, p is, an, is a probability, transform this state 
into, of course, trace of row is just the identity, it's just one, transform into a complete mixed state. So this is uh, a partially depolarizing channel, okay? With some probability, just throw away the state that you have and replace it with a completely mixed state. And this guy is CPT. And for instance, this object admit as a fixed point the identity operator, of course. So if you apply phi of identity, D, this is just mapped into the identity. And in this case, you can prove this is the only fixed point of the channel. Okay? But this is just an example. If you have more complex example than that, you still have a fixed point. Okay. So, let's discuss another example. So, there, of course, there are many different uh, 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 examples of quantum channels. This is the unitary channel. This is the partially depolarizing channel. And uh, as a, an extra example of a, of a quantum channel, I can uh, discuss about uh, entanglement breaking channel. Okay, so what is an entanglement breaking channel? An entanglement breaking channel phi is a CPT transformation, one of those guys that we have introduced before, which has uh, the following property. So, of course, it acts on a system S, but let's assume that we have prepared the system S into some initial state, rho S A, uh, which share some entanglement with uh, a, an ancillary system A. Okay? So let's see what happens in this case. And now we evolve this object through the action of the CPT map phi. And this guy is associated with the, the interaction of the environment of S with, uh, 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 with S, but uh, nothing happens to A because A is supposed not to interact with the environment that is tampering the dynamics of S. According, this object will be transformed into a new state which is given by phi tensor, the identity channel acting on A, on rho SA. This is something that we already have seen when we were discussing the CPT property. And now the channel is said to be entanglement breaking if for all possible choice of the input state rho SA, when you look at its output counterpart, this guy has no entanglement. No entanglement. So, an entanglement breaking channel basically is a channel which is so noisy that no matter what is the input state you inject into this process, what you get at the end is a state where no entanglement has survived. Okay, so this is a special instance of, of a quantum channel. Of course, it's a very noisy channel which tends to deteriorate the quantum coherence that you have in your system. Now, uh, this set of state, the, of this special subset of channels, uh, we know um, is, is, is pretty much very well characterized. And for instance, we know that uh, this, uh, um, they can be described. There is a theorem by Shore, Ruskai, and uh, I don't remember the third guy. I think it's uh, one of the Orodeki, but I'm not sure. Okay. Um, they have proven that um, in an, a, a quantum channel is entanglement breaking if and only if we can represent the action of this channel as a two-step process. So this channel here, which is entanglement breaking, um, is entanglement breaking if and only if we can represent this transformation as the following process. First, we perform some measurement on this guy. And the measurement is going to be a POVM. I'm going to introduce the notion of POVM 
uh, in the next lecture is, let's say, is just a generalized measurement that takes the state that enter into the system and produce some classical output. This is a classical output. Okay? Meaning that is just some measurement that you have performed on the system and you get some number. Yeah? Yeah? Uh, it's, uh, it's, for the moment, it's just uh, uh, a measurement. I don't care if it is selective or not. And the point is that when you get this number here, you use this number to prepare, uh, to, to trigger a, a state preparation device. So this is a state preparation device that takes this classical information and depending on this input, J, classical input J, prepare some output state rho J. Okay. And of course, the measurement, we, we average with respect to the, the, this, this measurement process. In other words, we don't have access to this classical information. Okay? So in this case, in this sense, it's not selective. Any quantum channel of this form is going to be entanglement breaking channel and vice versa. For this reason, because of this uh, representation, entanglement breaking channel are also said to be crypto um, classical in the sense that there is a classical communication line which goes, which is behind the representation of the channel itself. Okay? Okay, so these are just examples of quantum channels. I need my slides. Yeah, you think so? Because the computer is, is dead. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> so that's a problem, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I can continue with the blackboard, but uh, if I have some power, it maybe it's better. So this guy that... No. You see? I don't know what happens here. Yeah, yeah. Now you... Yeah, so it's charging. Yeah, typically it just takes uh, a <laughs> few seconds to charge. Well, What's the problem computer? My Morgan computer. Fuck it. Can't easy. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you do. Uh, okay. Okay, so I will go, I will continue with the blackboard. Yeah? I'm in the middle of a crisis because apparently my computer is dead. Anyway. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, so what else we can say about quantum channels? So we have said they are contractive, they have admit fixed points, and now it's time to discuss about composition rules. Uh, yeah, perfect. Okay. Composition rules. Of quantum channels. Okay, so let's phi let's phi one and phi two be CPT transformations. So let's say they are two quantum channels like this guy that I have introduced here, then you can construct a new map, phi, which is just given by the convex combination of the two guys. So things like this, where P is, is a probability. So the convex combination of quantum channels is yet a quantum channel, okay? So this property, you can prove it. And the way you prove it is simply to show that, by showing that if these guys are completely positive, then also this guy is completely positive and trace preserving. You can do that. Uh, okay, so now what this means, it means that the set of quantum channel that act on a given system is a convex. 
of good channel form a convex. It's closed under um, a convex combination. Okay, so the way <clears throat> this is composition rules number one. Composition rules number two is the following. Suppose, again, phi1 and phi2 are quantum channels acting on a given system, then you can create a new channel by simply composing the two. Something like you can create a new channel phi1, 2 by acting first on the system with the channel 2, okay? And then, after that, acting on the system with the channel phi1. The resulting map, we just represent it as phi1 compose phi2, and it turns out it's also CPT, is CPT. So it's a legitimate quantum transformation. It does work, that's good. Okay, sorry about that. Trace percent, T, it's trace percent, yeah. Okay, okay. okay. good. Okay, so good, we are here. Okay. <laughs> No, no, okay, it does work. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So good, so I can go back to my slides. So this is the, the I was just introducing the concatenation property here of quantum channel, and uh, so you can compose quantum channel to form a new one, and that means that the set of CPT is uh, form a semigroup, which is ne not necessarily abelian in the sense that if you reverse the, the way you compose these two guys, not necessarily you obtain the same channel, and this has to do with the, the non-commutativity of quantum mechanics, of course. And um, it's a semigroup, not a group, just because uh, we have already seen that CPT in general don't emit an inverse. So you may have the identity operator, element which is given by the identity channel, but you don't have the inverse for all possible transformation. By the way, how much time do we have? 15 minutes, okay, so great. And finally, uh, uh, we can also define the tensor product of, of quantum channels, meaning that if you have two channels that act independently on two systems, say phi one acting on system one and phi two acting on system two, then you can define uh, the tensor product of these two guys as phi1, tensor phi2, and also this object is going to be CPT. So these are the way you can compose channels. Okay, so that's enough for the, the, the formal represent, way of representing quantum channels. So, um, so now let's consider the, the case in which you do have one of these objects that allows you to transfer in a noisy way, possibly, signals from one guy, Helis, to the other one, Bob. And this is, for instance, is a, a realistic representation of an extreme example of a quantum channel that was realized a few years ago during this experiment in which people were just sending uh, light pulses from uh, uh, this observatory here to, to the one on Tenerife for a very long distance. And uh, of course, the, the signal that were transferred in this process were affected by the noise, by the medium, uh, which, um, which in somehow destroyed the, the information that you try to send from Helis to Bob. And this kind of mapping, uh, independently from the fact it is kind of complex because you have to deal with the, the propagation of light pulses through free air and so on and so forth, can be still described in terms of one of, of one of those maps that we have uh, analyzed before. And now, in this kind of a situation, you have a model for a of, of a quantum channel that describes the communication uh, line, and you can ask yourself how reliably can we use this kind of, uh, 
this process here in order to transfer messages from Helis to Bob. And in particular, you can ask yourself how, how efficient is a communication line of this form in transferring classical message from Helis to Bob. Now, in order to answer this question, I need to uh, go a step back and uh, describe uh, and, and, uh, and introduce the notion of, 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 of channel capacity. And uh, for, doing, for, for, for this purpose, I need to uh, uh, remind you uh, what uh, was done in the context of classical information theory. So in classical information theory, you, uh, you, have, uh, you can uh, ask similar question to the one that we were considering now. But of course, the, 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 the situation here is uh, slightly more uh, uh, simpler. Is, is simpler than, than before. So first of all, in classical information theory, you don't have quantum state. Of course, you have random variables that you use to encode information from, from Helis to Bob. So you have some input random variable x, which is uh, um, that Helis has, uh, over which Helis has the control. And then this uh, random variable is transferred to Bob, but because of the noise, uh, he will not receive x as Helis has prepared, but it will receive a transformed version of that st uh, symbol of that uh, random variable according to some mapping p y given x which represent the action of a, a noisy channel uh, in the classical representation so basically this uh, conditional probability p uh, y of x which represent the statistical error that the propagation uh, introduced into the communication are the uh, formal equivalent of the CPT map that we have described before, while the random variable represents the formal equivalent of the density matrix that we are using in quantum, in quantum information. Now, and again, you can ask yourself what is the, how efficiently you can transfer message from Helis to Bob when you are in the presence of some non-trivial noise acting in the communication line. Now, um, so an example of a channel of this form is given, for instance, by this uh, uh, binary symmetric channel model, where x, the uh, input variable selected by Helis, is a bit, and y, the input variable received by Bob, is also a bit. But the two guys are related through a statistic process in which, with some probability p, Bob receives exactly this, the symbol that Helis has selected, and with probability 1 minus p, instead, he receives the opposite symbol. And of course, if you have a channel of this form, um, Bob, when Bob receives one symbol, he cannot uh, de uh, decide with certainty whether the zero was indeed a zero or it was a one, which was transformed by the noise into a zero. And again, the question is, how can we improve the efficiency of the communication line in this context? And of course, in classical information, there are strategies that allow you to overcome this kind of noise, and these strategies have to do with error correction. And in error correction, in the classical error correction, basically what you do, you use redundancy. You copy the same signal many, many times, and you send it through the channel, uh, the same symbol, and at the end of the transmission, Bob simply, uh, uh, depending on the number of zero and one that he receive by using, say, a majority voting technique, can decide whether or not the Ellis was trying to send a single zero or a single one, be simply because the signal is repeated many, 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 many times. Okay, so this is uh, very effective, but there is a but. And the problem is that you can improve the quality of the transmission of information, but you have to pay a price. And the price is that in order to send a, symbol, a, single, sing, uh, a single bit, say a single zero, now you are using the channel more than a single time. In this case, you are using the channel three times in order to decrease the error probability of the transmission. And this, um, of course, uh, um, Introduce the no automatically gives you uh, introduce the notion of rate, okay? So the rate of the communication now is is given by the number of bits that you can transfer divided by the number of channel uses of of uses of the channel that you are that are needed in order to transfer that number of bits. 
So this is the real figure of merit that you, want, that you have to consider if you want to determine how good is the, the, trans, the communication in this kind of model. Because it is true that you can decrease the error probability, but you are increasing the number of pulses that you have to send in order to decrease such number of bits. And uh, the rate is the good figure of merit that you, you, you may consider. Now, uh, of course, there are different error, quantum er uh, so error um, uh, uh, correcting strategies that you can try, and each one of them will have a different kind of rate. And the, of course, the thing that you are aiming at is uh, the optimal uh, rate. Okay, and the optimal rate that is the highest value of this number R that you see there gives you exactly the definition of channel of capacity of your quantum channel. So the capacity of a classical channel is the maximum achievable uh, rate that you can obtain. By achievable rate, we mean a rate that ensure um, uh, zero, error, zero error probability probability in the limit in which you are sending many, 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 many messages. So you have to take a, a limit with respect to n, where n is the number of message that you want to send in, from Helis to Bob. And OK, so uh, the, the, the classical capacity of a channel is formally defined by that awful expression in which you have to optimize with respect to all possible encoding and decoding procedure, and then you have to take a limit over the number of channel uses that are involved into the process. Sorry? Epsilon. Epsilon is the error probability, sorry. So you have to take this. Uh, epsilon is, the error pro is, is an upper bound you put on the error probability of the decoding of the process. You have to take the limit in which the error probability goes to zero, a limit where the number of channel uses goes to infinity, and then you compute the rate and you take the optimal, the maximum value of this, of this object here. Okay? So it's an awful expression, really an awful expression. But likely enough, we do have good theorems that allows us to explicitly compute this, this, uh, this value here. And the theorem that allows us to compute this quantity is the noisy channel coding theorem by Shannon. So Shannon was able to show that this awful optimization limit that you have here, this, li this awful limit that you see here, admits a very simple and elegant and compact expression, which is the one that I'm providing you here. So the capacity of a channel is given by the maximum uh, mutual information of the channel itself, where you maximize with respect to all possible choice uh, of, the, of the probability of uh, generating a given input, in, uh, sending a given in, a symbol into the channel. The mutual information, I think, was already introduced by Martin uh, a few lectures ago, so I don't need to discuss about that. But the things that you should appreciate when you see this formula is that you start from this amazing complex uh, quantity here to a, a relatively simple and elegant expression here. And this theorem was proven by, by Shannon. Yes? Yeah. Yes? This, this quantity here? Okay, so this quantity, so here I'm just uh, using a kind of compact notation for this symbol here represent a coding procedure. A coding procedure is simply defined by a number of possible code words that you can select at the beginning and a measurement that you have to perform at the, at the, at the, at the, out, at the receiving stage. So this is a coding procedure. Each coding procedure, C, is associated with an average error probability that you can compute, okay? And then you evaluate this, this quantity here, and you must consider those coding that ensure an error probability which is below this a threshold epsilon. And then you have to take the limit with respect to epsilon and then to n. It's not simple to compute, and, but this is formally well-defined, okay? So, error probability associated with the coding, okay? Uh, okay, so let's see. 
Okay, so I'm not sure I can finish uh, the lecture today because I lost too much time <laughs> because of the problem with the computer, but I will uh, at least uh, try to finish this part, okay? And the part I want to discuss is how to generalize this notion of classical capacity in the case where you, your channel is given by a quantum channel. So the guy that we have seen before, for instance. Okay, so suppose now you have a quantum channel that allows you to transfer quantum pulses, say photons, from Helis to Bob. Okay, and the mapping phi represents the, the evolution of the propagation of the signal through the channel. This takes the place, the role of the conditional probability in the classical model. Now, we can use this object to transfer classical information by simply encoding the classical message represented by some classical random variable x into the state uh, of the pulses that are transferred into the communication line. So there is uh, a classical to quantum encoding stage which takes place on Ellis side where you prepare some input state of the carriers, you send the carriers through the channel, and then Bob received the transformed version of these states. And here, Bob does what we may call a quantum to classical decoding procedure, which is basically a measurement. So Bob received the state, measure it somehow, trying to guess what was the symbol X that Bob, that Alice was trying to send to him. So if you look at the input-output connection at this stage, you, get, you start with a classical message, which is a random variable, and you end up with a classical output, which is the result of the measurement that Bob is performing. But in between, there is the quantum part of the communication, which has to do with this quantum, classical to quantum encoding and quantum to classical decoding procedure. Well, now, basically, we can simply apply the same result that we have obtained for the classical line because at least from this point to this point, the channel is completely classical. I, classical input, classical output. So when you fix the encoding here and the QC encoding, the coding here, basically you have, and you have a, a fixed model of, of, of a quantum channel, what you end up is just a classical channel. And for this classical channel, we can construct, uh, we can compute the classical capacity. And uh, uh, you, you can construct, you can compute the classical capacity of this object. But the point is now that we can optimize the rate that we obtain, not only in terms of uh, the choice of the input X and the uh, data processing of the output Y that we receive, but we can also optimize with respect to all possible classical to quantum encoding and quantum to classical decoding. Okay, so you can define a notion of classical capacity also in this case, exactly as you do before, but now the strategy that you are optimizing with uh, uh, here are not just classical strategy, but include this state preparation and measurement procedure that you can try to optimize. Okay, now it is important to notice that Already at this level, there is an important difference between the classical model and the quantum model. Because uh, in optimizing with respect to the classical to quantum encoding, there are at least two different uh, um, things that you can do. So for instance, you can create, uh, you can prepare your, the initial state of, of your carriers into some separable state, like here, or you can prepare entangle uh, you can entangle the different pulses that you send through the channel. And this is called an entanglement coding. And depending whether or not you include this separable encoding into the optimization that you are performing here, you obtain two different definitions of the classical capacity of a quantum channel. So this one is the C1 capacity or Olevo capacity of the channel, which is the a maximum rate of information you can send if you restrict yourself into the process where you prepare your input carriers into separable inputs, not entangled input. And then you have the full capacity of the channel while instead you are allowing yourself for the use of entangled state 
as input state of your communication line. So for instance, like this uh, massive superposition here. <clears throat> okay, so how much time is over? Yeah. So, okay, so I think I will stop here and we continue tomorrow and uh, we'll see how, depending on the, these two different choices, you can have, you, how, how to compute this quantity here and uh, uh, what else we can do with, uh, with uh, quantum channel. So I apologize for the, the trouble I had with the computer. I hope tomorrow is gonna be like that. Okay, thank you.